So the last few weeks have been uh, unprecedented, really, um, for all of us, and uh, particularly for professional communicators. Um, a lot of change that we've had to manage in a very short space of time, whether it's been managing uh, the closure of sites or, or, or shops, particularly seeing the retail sector affected, um, had a whole industries shut down, whether it's been in sports or whether it's been airlines, travel, um, we've seen pay reductions, so you know people either being uh, asked to take sort of significant pay cuts, um, or indeed uh, you know, we've, had, we've seen this sort of the new sort of phenomenon of people being followed. And sadly, we've also seen people um, being made redundant. Um, we've all had to deal with uh, the travel restrictions, the social distancing that the government has asked us to, to look at. Um, and more positively, we've had to communicate or had the opportunity to communicate some of the wonderful things that um, our, our colleagues have been doing around volunteering, whether it's been helping the NHS or, or working in the local community. Um, and we've also been fortunate to see some of the, the contributions that, that, that big organisations or some of our clients have made to society. One of our clients, LVMH, uh, repurposed some of its sites to, to make hand sanitizer. Uh, and we've seen a number of organisations get involved in the in the um, battle to kind of build um, ventilators to support the NHS. We've all had to deal with uh, with a lot of our colleagues, uh, you know, working remotely. Um, you know, often um, shifting um, whole parts of our operation uh, to remote working overnight. Um, and we're sort of entering this sort of brave new world of of using technology. So a lot of change in a very short space of time. Um, I suppose our perspective, the multiple perspective on this, is that there's sort of three phases to this, uh, this, this pandemic. And we're kind of dealing with the first two phases and, in, 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 you know, to some extent right now. The first is, the, I guess, the immediate crisis, the immediate support that people need to deal with workforce related issues. And I suppose the consequence of some of those has been some very difficult business decisions, the ones that I've just outlined in terms of restructuring redundancies and sort of fallout from the, of, that comes off the back of that. And some of the reputational issues that that, that 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 might entail and those are kind of living with us right now looking further ahead though there is a an opportunity for us to think about the post-pandemic recovery and how organizations begin to think about the shift back to the physical workspace and how they might take some of the learning from working remotely back into the brave new world um, so you know we have had a, a great opportunity to have a discussion around some of these issues um, and we're now going to move uh, to some of the, the, the great guest speakers that we had on our recent change exchange who will talk a little bit about their experiences. So the first thing I've learned um, over the last three weeks has been how important it is to be really clear about your message and, and also to tailor that message accordingly. So it's been a really weird comms proposition um, in the Met because for 12,000 of our staff, the message is you can work from home you can work remotely, if you can do your job remotely, follow the government guidance. For our 30,000 officers, the message is the opposite of that. It's to say, um, actually, we don't want you to stay at home. We want you to continue to police London. We appreciate that you're putting yourselves at risk, but when you signed up as a police officer, this is the gig you signed up to. Um, so we've had countless discussions about the ethics of that. Um, and in the early days, probably three, three and a half weeks ago, um, we had lots of conversations about how best to make that message clear. Um, but it's been a difficult one because we're not talking to one uniform organization. So we've had to absolutely make sure um, that we segmented the messages accordingly. The second thing I've learned is about listening. So um, it's really important um, that as an organization, we're listening to what our employees are saying and we're, we're listening to what the public are saying as well. So listening really has been at the heart of our approach and um, particularly around employee voice. Um, so being able to get access to the analytics that are available internally. So last week we discovered that 96% of our calls to the HR helpline were coronavirus related. And, a lot, and the majority of those questions were questions that we had dealt with in the internal communication, which I think leads to another conundrum, which is around information overload. There is so much information out there. Um, how do I and how do my team make sure we signpost that information well? Um, uh, our seven-year strategy, the Met Direction, has as its core 
uh, a pillar that talks about caring for our people. We want to be an organization that cares for its people. Um, so as a consequence, um, we've been very hot on listening to what employees um, have to say about what's going on, whether they're police staff or police officers. Um, and I've put in place a dedicated person who's actually responding to those employee comments every single day. The third thing I think I've learned, um, employers are currently the most trusted source of information. Um, and that's no surprise, really, given what a strange and kind of terrifying time it is for everyone. Um, and given how globally different countries are approaching it in different ways. Um, but I suppose what I've taken from that and, and our approach internally has been really focusing on our leaders and making sure we have discrete leadership channels um, where we can hear from our leaders, but also talk to our leaders and make sure that messages coming from management board um, and from our more senior cop who's managing the London response to coronavirus are getting through and also that senior leaders have the opportunity to make sense of this because we're asking them to lead in a crisis um, and it's a crisis that's going to go on and on and on this isn't a major incident like we're used to dealing with like a terror attack this is one that will rumble on and on and on so how do we ensure that resilience clarity of message consistency during that time um, I've had to stand up a team in very very quick period of time over the last three weeks so that we have um, not only individuals within our pod, where you've got all the business group heads uh, working in a really agile way to respond to all those comments coming in, but also making sure we're getting the messages out. Um, and then having cover right up until 10 o'clock in the evening, um, which for us in internal communication is really different. It's um, if you work press office side, you're very used to that. You're very used to working on call. You're very wor used to wor very working very long hours. The pace has been relentless. Um, the volume of stuff coming in, keeping on top of the tasking has been so, so challenging. Um, and I think, you know, trying to make sense of all of that within that maelstrom has been really, really challenging for the team. Which, and what we're doing is working with our social media team to generate those really good stories, particularly if there are officers out there doing amazing volunteering work, which of course is what they've been doing. Um, but how we sustain that morale in the long term, I think that's that's something that we're going to continue to grapple with, continue to think, think about. Um, and we're going to pivot our comms now in the weeks to follow uh, more around well-being. So less about the operational updates, which has been the big focus, getting the rhythm in place, getting the channels in place, uh, and more to the actual well-being, making sure you're okay. If you're assaulted, making sure you know the route that you, know, you can report that by, but also for our police staff, making sure they're okay as well working remotely in a way they've never done before. But I'm sure others will cover that in more detail um, because their organizations have a bigger representation of that. Um, when, uh, when it became clear that this, this was uh, going to be a very real uh, reality for people, um, I'll echo what, what other people have said on, on the call in that um, frequency of communication, speed of communication, clarity of communication, it's all very, very important um, at, this, at this moment in time. And our executive team uh, have been meeting daily um, and I've been included on that, which I found very useful uh, so that I can hear that conversation and then immediately turn around the communications that need to go out off the back of that. So having that kind of task force and making it clear to people across the business that this team was meeting daily, that there'd be communications coming out of the back of that um, has, been, has been really useful and obviously uh, providing an opportunity for people to feed in questions uh, into that meeting um, so that uh, we, we can respond very quickly if people have got any issues or concerns that need to be addressed. So I think we've got into a rhythm um, with, uh, you know, those daily executive uh, meeting calls, a daily email off the back of that, and then a weekly meeting for our managers um, so that we can get the cascade going throughout the organisation, um, which I think um, has, been, has been helpful. But I do think we're at the risk now maybe of over-communication, I think, to, to, uh, to Claire's point. Um, so I think we need to be really careful about um, what we do going forward. I think uh, for, the, for the past couple of weeks, um, there has been that need for, for very regular communications. But again, I think to Yvonne's point, there's that risk of people not being able to sift through and work out what's really important to them um, and, uh, you know, a, a risk that some important messages get overlooked. 
So going going forward, um, I think we need to to really think about how we filter uh, things, how we present things in different ways. I think we've had a heavy reliance on on email, um, but trying to uh, switch up some of the channels that we're using. We have an intranet, um, but maybe more video content, which we haven't really used before. We haven't been very comfortable with that kind of thing up until now. But I think this is going to be the new reality for a long time and uh, making sure that we, we keep our communications fresh for people um, is going to be very, very, very helpful. So on Monday, the 16th of March, Andrew Bailey started as the new governor of the Bank of England. On Tuesday, the 17th of March, we went into lockdown. And the thing that has absolutely uh, impressed me and made my job a lot easier has been Andrew's absolute commitment to senior leadership visibility in this period. Um, despite the fact that he's been obviously working with the Chancellor um, and many other uh, people on um, our, our policy response, um, he has taken time every week, um, nearly every day actually, uh, to do something um, commu communications wise with staff. Um, we've been doing weekly video updates with him. He's doing calls with different leadership groups. He started virtual coffee mornings um, with staff that will start from next week onwards. So he's made every effort um, to support our internal communications approach um, and absolutely really importantly that that level of senior leadership of visibility um, has played such an important role I think in keeping motivation and morale really high in the bank at this time 